Happy Sabbath, church. It's good to be with you all. I hope you've had a good week so far. A um, lot of people getting crook out there, um, unfortunately. So yeah, as Diego said, please stay safe. Um, I wanted to start this morning, um, I, just not a story, but share a little memory I have um, of when I'm at, I was at Avondale. Um, in case you don't know, Avondale's where um, I went to study to be a minister. And um, when I got to Avondale, it was 2007. Doesn't that seem so long ago? Um, it was 2007. And um, I remember sitting in the classroom for the very first time with all of my peers, the guys who I would spend the next four years with, learning, studying, being stretched, all of these things. And, um, you know, we, we had these larger events where all of the theology faculty would get together and you'd see all of the different students here and there, the up-and-coming students. And, um, man, you're, you're, as a first-year student, you're sitting in, the, in this sort of room full of all these other folks and you're just like, wow, like, am I going to be able to to be as good as these guys and you'd hear like they're going on mission trips and they're doing evangelism series on their summer holidays and you're like, oh wow, like they must be something. <laughs> um, I've never done anything like that. So anyway, I get to know some of my friends, uh, my peers in my own year level and I, if I'm honest with you, there was nothing particularly uh, amazing about my cohort of friends. We weren't anything special to look at. We didn't have any crazy credentials before we came into the theology program. We hadn't been to Africa and preached some cool, you know, evangelistic series, which some students had. We hadn't, you know, been to this course over in America and studied. And, and a lot of us were really, we were just, you know, average Joes from our local churches. But when I look at us today... Where, we, where these guys, these guys I studied with are. Um, one of my best friends, she is um, the ministerial secretary for the Australian Union Conference. There's a male and a female to work with pastors from uh, both male and female pastors. She's 34 years old and is the first female ministerial secretary. And I'm like, wow, that's incredible. I look at one of my friends, a Samoan guy, Travis Siutu, and um, he's like in far north Queensland. He's a youth director, he's personal ministries leader, he does Sabbath school leadership all across the north of Australia. And I remember, I, heard, I don't know if this is being recorded, I remember in our homiletics class where we learned to preach, our homiletics lecturer got up and walked out of his sermon. <laughs> it was that great. <laughs> But I look at Travis and like, he's just become this amazing pastor. I look at some of the guys, we didn't get into, we haven't gotten into admin, we're not, you know, running conferences or big things, but they are great, solid pastors. My good friend, Lindell, my best friend, her husband, Adrian, is a pastor at Plenty Valley Church. He's done amazing things. Then I look at my friend, Ray Ray, he's a, he's a Samoan guy as well. And uh, he went on to, he is currently the, the chaplain for Brisbane's netball team, as in the national netball competition. He is their chaplain. He's also a military chaplain. And during COVID, he was, if you know NRL, he was the New Zealand Warriors chaplain. Just average Joes. And, and if to look at us at first, you'd be like, oh, they're just average Joes. We didn't do all of the things people usually did. We weren't the, the people you'd look to and go, oh, they're going to be somebody. But here's the thing. I know a lot of these people and their journey and their stories. There's countless others. And look, I'm going to be honest with you. It hasn't been easy to get where they are. There's been hard roads. Should I be in ministry? Should I be doing admin or whatever it is I've been doing? Am I good at this? I, I shared last night with some of our team some of the doubts I've had in my own life about ministry. But, you know, you, you, you stick, stay the course and you just let God keep on doing what he's doing and amazing things can happen. Why do I share this? Yeah, my friends and I, we all chose to serve God in a full-time capacity. 
And, and, and when I look at a church, I often see a group of people who God has equally called. Maybe not just to serve them in that full-time capacity. But what can God do to an average Joe church who choose to make themselves available to God? I mean, maybe you don't have all of the experiences of another church. Maybe we're not up and coming like some big church in some other part of the country or the world. But what can God do if a church humbles themselves and says, hey, we're here, we're available, use us how you want us to be used. That's what I find the beauty. This is, why, this is the staying power that, that I've had with Jesus because I know that he's interested in me. And I need you to know that he is interested in you too. And he wants, he wants you to do something powerful for the kingdom. But do you believe that? Do you believe that? Do you believe that it, maybe yours is just to come here every week and hear a great sermon, sing some nice songs, do some corporate prayer? Or do you actually believe that God is calling you to more? God is calling you to be a disciple, somebody who sits at the feet of Jesus. It takes a bit of a mindset shift because so many of us, we're really just used to doing the week on, week out thing. But when I read Luke, I see that he is inviting all of us to be followers. And, and this is, again, this is why I love the story of Jesus because the 12, like the 12, Man, they were average Joes. And if God can use some fishermen to change the world, what can he do with Pakenham Church? Amen? Amen. Amen. Last week we looked at the question of Christology. Who is Jesus as painted by Luke in chapter 9? And we saw that you cannot understand Christology, who Jesus is, without being a disciple as well. They go hand in hand. And so this week, we're going to look at the flip side of the coin. What do we learn about discipleship in Luke chapter 9? So we're going to be sort of bouncing around the chapter. You might see in your book, or your book, your Bible, sorry, there's a bunch of subheadings, there's lots of stories, but collectively they show us some of the experiences that Jesus was wanting to instill into his disciples. Now, today I'm going to take a bit of a shotgun approach. There are a lot of ideas that are going to come out. Usually I like to try and stick with one or two main ideas, but because we're journeying through chapter 9, there's a lot of ideas that are going to come out. And I'm hoping, like a shotgun, you, know, you watch the Olympics, I always find it funny when you see the women and the shotguns, and they're always like, pull! And it's just that really gruff pull, and the, that claymore goes up, and they shoot the thing. Shotguns work because you've got all these bullets that just go everywhere. And I'm hoping one of these bullets will land with you today. We're going to learn a few things. I'm just going to just sort of ask you to file it away because maybe this is the thing you need to learn. But in chapter 9, we're going to see that disciples have been given power. Do you know that you've been given power? Maybe that's a shot that you need today. We see in chapter 9 that disciples, very simple, but they need faith. What's your faith look like now? Does somebody here need to hear a message where God is stretching them in their faith? Now, we again see that faith is needed, but like I said, in chapter 9, we don't see that faith is just alone, but God is going to stretch the faith of a disciple. Maybe you've been a Christian for a long time at the feet of Jesus. Maybe he needs to extend you a little bit more. We also see in chapter 9 that disciples walk hard roads. Are you willing and prepared to walk a hard road in following and sitting at the feet of Jesus? These are some of the questions we need to wrestle with. So I need you, I'm hoping one of you will see yourselves in, in one of these, these points. Now in chapter 9, we see Jesus refer, or Luke was referring to the 12, but also the large group. And I need you to see that, that this is being very intentional. Jesus is wanting to address not just these 12 men, but all disciples that will follow. Okay? 
And you and I are disciples that are following 2,000 years later, and these words still matter today. So let's get into the story. We're going to start in verse 1, which is a perfect place to start if you're looking at chapter 9. And in chapter 9, verse 1, it reads, And Jesus called the twelve together. That's the, the, the twelve disciples, the twelve apostles. And watch this, guys. He gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure disease. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. Note that Jesus, the very first thing he does is he calls his disciples. Now, in Luke, we've already seen them actually be called. But if you're going to if you're going to receive what God has, you need to be called. And I've challenged us and I hope if somebody here has not accepted Jesus, know that he is calling you today. And if you've been called today, the best time to say yes to Jesus is now. But Jesus calls his disi- disciples And notice this, I talked about this briefly last week, but he hands over his power. Power over demons, power to cure diseases. He also sends them to proclaim the gospel, that is the good news of his kingdom and its values and how different it looks. And if we can summarize, I need you to see this because this is what we're being called to do. You might say to yourself, I have never cast out a demon. I haven't, by the way. I've never cast out a demon. Don't really want to, but maybe God will call me to it. Okay? God is calling us to do these things. And here's my summary. God is calling the disciple to spiritual warfare. Can you say yes to that? Can you pray for somebody who's going through a hard time? That family member who you see in the rut of life and they keep making the same decisions, the same choices, they need to be broken out. Can you make a difference? I dare say you can. On your knees, helping them in a personal way. I don't know what God's calling you, but we are called to spiritual warfare. We are also called, and I want you to see this, we are called to bring healing into people's lives. Amen? And man, hasn't our church been well positioned to offer a message of health? Hey, do you know that maybe it's a good idea that you should take a day off? You've been working like, you know, flat chat. You need to take a day off. And the reason why I say this is because that's what God made you to be. A person has at least a day off. It's going to change your life. See that person who's suffering with cholesterol issues? I think you need to back off the meat. Pastor Ryan, back off the meat. Pray for me. I'm slowly trying to back off the meat. My wife's been trying to help me for a long time and with no success. But maybe Pastor Ryan needs to back off the meat. You can make a difference. I'm not saying give up meat altogether, but we have some things that can powerfully affect people's lives, right? Jesus is very simple. Spiritual warfare, health, we can do this, right? Now notice this. When we do those two things... Jesus says it puts people in a posture to receive the kingdom. You can now go proclaim. And isn't Ellen White say the right hand of the gospel is the health message? When we touch people's lives practically, when we alleviate suffering practically, people are more, well, we're better positioned to hear the things we have to share. But so often we rage in like a bull in a china shop and say, three angels message, revelation, Daniel, come to faith. And they're like, you don't know me. I have no relationship with you. Why should I listen to you? And so Jesus lays it out really simple. Pray for the people who are suffering, who need it. Step into somebody's life. You know, we've just been talking, Anna and I, about Queenie. Queenie's one of our sisters. She's just gone to hospital. She's been at home alone for like 10 hours a day while her son's at work, not eating. Thank God for people like Anna who've brought soup to help and and help her out. I mean, can you do something like that? Yeah, it's a bit, I'm putting it back at us, right? (laughs) But can we do something like that in in somebody's life? And, And imagine the reception you get when you know that somebody's doing this on behalf. Why are you doing this? I feel like Jesus is compelling me to do this. 
Jesus. I know about Jesus, but I've never seen Christians do this. I mean, how different will the community be when they know we are doing good things because Jesus compels us to do it? I mean, can you do this? It's so simple. And yet here it is. Spiritual warfare, health, share the word. We can all do these things. Now notice Jesus gives away power and authority to do this. And I want you to see this because maybe some of you are like, I don't know. I don't know, you know, like, you feel like me and my group of friends in that first year, 2007, like, we don't really know. Are we going to, like, be able to do something for God? I need you to see so far in the story, the disciples have done nothing. Luke mentions them, but they just, Jesus healed and the disciples were there. and Jesus fed and they've just been hanging out. They have done nothing to earn receiving this gift. They have not proven themselves. We know Judas is going to betray Jesus in a year or two, and yet he still gives authority and power to to be a powerful disciple maker. You don't have to do anything to receive what God is offering you in the service of his kingdom. If anything, it's just say, look, Lord, I am messed up. I'm sorry, but can you work with the mess? And doesn't he work with the mess, which are those 12 men? Amen? He can work in your lives. He can do things. Don't write yourself off. But at the same time, don't be proud, but just humble yourself before Jesus and know that he is giving his authority and power, the thing he uses to change the community, he is offering to give it to you for free. Hallelujah. I mean, that's so powerful. This is at our fingertips, and we don't tap into it. I'm, en- I'm enjoying Luke. Are you guys enjoying Luke? There's some powerful stuff coming out in Luke. Okay? So notice this, guys. When we receive this power and authority, here's what happens. Ryan can now take steps into Pakenham and push back the kingdom of Satan. Can you see that? Because that's what Jesus is asking me to do, to cast out demons, to bring healing, to give hope. I am expanding Jesus' kingdom territory. And the question is, for Pakenham Church being here for as long as it has, have we pushed back the kingdom of Satan? Are people's lives, maybe not Pakenham, but in our own family, are lives looking different For the people we love who don't know Jesus, who don't care about Jesus. But is there a noticeable marked difference because I'm there? I'm helping to take a load. I'm I'm wanting to show them Jesus. Have you seen any kingdom pushback? If you haven't, maybe it's time we do, right? I'm here to rally the troops. Are we here to get excited? We're not not charismatic Pentecostal, but come on. We excited to push the kingdom... Satan's kingdom backwards? I mean, I really am. But we're going to see it's not an easy thing to do. This takes serious work. And we've got to be real about that. Now, Jesus will send these disciples. And look at what he says. A lot of what I'm about to read is very um, historically relevant. It doesn't apply to us. But there is a big take-home, and we will need to revisit these ideas later. I want to read verse 3 and 5. Now, Jesus said to them, take nothing. He's sending them out. He's given them authority, power, heal demons, bring healing to lives, share the good news. I'm sending you out to do this. Take nothing for your journey. No staff, no bag, no bread, no money. Do not have two tunics. Whatever house you enter, stay there. And from there, depart. And whatever they do, uh, do not. If, uh, so, what, and wherever they do not receive you, when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet, as a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Okay, the disciples are going to need faith to do this. God's graciously given these gifts, but the the disciples are going to actually have to take a step of faith and trust. That not bringing anything, not having anything, uh, you know, any earthly possessions, just the clothes on their back, 
I mean, that God will provide. As a disciple, you need to trust that God is going to open doors for you. And I think this is where we struggle. <laughs> because we're like, I know my brother, and I've talked to him about Jesus, and he's just like, get lost. <laughs> I've tried it. I know what's going to happen. But Jesus says, walk in faith all the same. And I think this is something we don't do. When we think about this, we make a very calculated, and I'm, I'm preaching to myself here, guys. We make a very calculated, you know, assessment of the situation. How like, what's the probability of this conversation going well? If it's not in our favor, I'm probably not going to talk, right? You know what I'm talking about? But Jesus is saying, step out in faith. Trust. Take nothing Stay there, and if the people don't receive you, shake the dust off your heels. This is a thing that Jews did when they went to a Gentile town, and the Gentiles were rude. You would shake the dust as a sign of these people, they're, they're just, they're just don't even, they're not even worth looking back for. And Jesus is saying, do that for people who reject my message. That's a bit of a challenge for us. Now, I want you to file this because we're going to, we've jumped a few things. Jesus has, uh, Luke's talked about King Herod and we looked at him last week and Herod's interested in Jesus, who he is. And now we get to this miracle story where Jesus is going to feed 5,000 people. And I want to pick up the story in verse 10. It says in verse 10, on their return, so the disciples have gone out with nothing in faith, having been given authority, given all of these gifts and these tools to do the job, on their return, the apostles told him all that they have done. We've gone out into the villages. We've done what you've said. All right? And it doesn't seem like it, it didn't work. We don't get any negative reports. So he took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. Last week, we looked at Jesus who was praying for discovery. Remember that? For those of you who are there. The conversation he was meant to have was meant to happen in Bethsaida. But instead, God is going to bring a crowd of 5,000 people. You never knew that the, five, the story of the feeding of the 5,000, it was never meant to happen. Can you see that? If Jesus had his way, he would have been talking to his disciples about the hard things that are going to happen to them. To be a follower of Jesus, you're going to have to go through some hard things. And Jesus has gotten away to a lonely place to pray and to break the news. But God's got other plans in mind, and, and the, the disciples, we know that they've been effective because thousands of people have come and followed them. Can you see that? Twelve men went out. How many people come back? Five thousand. Guys, can, can God work through us and do some incredible things? Yes. Please believe that. And I don't want to put a cap on what God can do. We can't fit everyone we love in this building, but God can make it work. Amen. So these guys have just witnessed and 5,000 people follow them back. And Jesus is like, I just wanted to pray. I wanted to tell them about the hard things that are going to happen. Okay. And, and here's what's interesting. Jesus is like, okay, um, I'm going to teach these people. I'm going to heal these people. You can read it in Luke. We're just skipping over a bit. And then the disciples say, all right, Jesus, we've done our thing. We've done the show. We've healed. We've cast demons out. We've, we've preached. We have to send these people home. Okay? Now, here's the interesting thing. These men have just been in the homes of these people, and it's like, we've got to get rid of them. I mean, isn't that nice hospitality? <laughs> think about it. I want you to think about this story a little bit differently. It's not like... How are we going to feed them? No, they're just like, uh, I, was just, I was just at, you know, Shenando's house and she fed me and she gave me some food and I taught her and I go, I've had enough of you. I mean, that's, that's the dynamic here. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you why this is important. It's important because they're meant to be nurturing and growing these people. And, the, and they've hit a roadblock and they can't see a way forward. So they're like, all right, we're just going to give up. And Jesus is going to use this opportunity to stretch their faith. Jesus is going to ask them, um, guys, we need, to feed the, we need to feed these people. All right? We need to feed these people. 
Um, Jesus says in verse 13, he said to them, you give them something to eat. And they said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish. In the other gospels, we know where they get that from. They didn't even have that, right? Unless we are going to go and buy food for all these people. Now, here's this. I want you to see this. Knowing that Jesus sent them out with nothing, what do they have right now? Can you hear the sarcasm? All right? We have nothing. We've just come back with nothing. We have no more than five loaves and two fish. Unless we're going to go and buy, did Jesus say to bring money? No, they don't even have money. We don't have, we're not going to be able to buy food for all these people. Jesus has just said, go away, don't bring anything. Now they have nothing and they have a responsibility to these people. Jesus says, all right, what are we going to do? And they're like, I don't know, send them home. They've given up at the first obstacle. They've just been given authority and power. They've just brought 5,000 people to the evangelism. And they're like, all right, send them home. Do you see the problem there? They've given up already. And they, they, their sights were so low. They were like, oh, we reached 5,000 people. That's good. Send them back now. Friends, we cannot afford to make the same mistakes, right? But do we make the same mistakes? I dare say we do. And I said, there's something for everyone. How many of us have been in church for long enough to go, people are coming to church, people are coming to know Jesus, we hit some obstacles. Ah, oh, well, a room's still full. We might not be able to fit them all in. They can find another church. Now, I'm not saying this is the problem we have, but can you see the, the attitude? Jesus is like, come on, there's a way forward here. Trust in me. But are they willing to trust that God can fix the problem? They've just seen God's hand at work in these villages with these people, and at the first obstacle, they give up. Friends, God is wanting to stretch our faith. I have this story again from when I was at college, and it's, it's such, a, it's such a story. It's a story that stuck with me. I don't know about you guys, for those of you um, who, like, <laughs> I, I'm, I shouldn't ask this. I can't remember a whole lot of the sermons I've heard growing up. And I don't know if you can remember all the sermons you've heard growing up. No, you can't. You can remember all of mine. I know that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but in class, we, it was sort of like mini sermons. And some of you guys would know my lecturer, Kale Duval, anyone? South African man, good guy. One of my, it was like literally one of our favorite lecturers. Cale often would, he would teach us about Revelation and the New Testament. And often we loved his classes because he was really good at teaching these, these academic classes, but he was really good at bringing his life experience into it. And he was sharing us, and I can't remember what part of South Africa he was from, but he was telling us this story about at his home church, Things were happening, and they had started to do these things where they were engaging the community, and people were going out. God was answering prayers, like they're like they were encountering problems in the community, and they would pray about it, and, and things were happening. And we were all on the, on the edge of our seats, because like, we, we love this. This is what we're here for. We want to do this kind of stuff. And he said, it was going so well. And, and this is a weird story. I'm going to be honest. It's a very weird story. He said, we had seen God do incredible things in answers to prayer, right? And then one day, it's like a matriarch or a patriarch of the church passed, very important person, but it was premature, like they were not terribly old, they were not, like it was just a shock to the whole church. And Cale is there and he's being asked to conduct the funeral. I, 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 I've already opened the lid, I've got to share this story. <sighs> We're all like, okay, cool. And he's like, but you know what, guys? I'm doing this funeral. There's the casket in the church. And he's like, I felt the strongest impression. This is weird. I know it is weird. I felt the strongest impression to walk over to the casket, to lay my hand on the deceased brother or sister, and in the name of Jesus say, rise. With every fiber of my being, I felt that. And we're all like... Are we allowed to believe this as Adventists? Like, what's, what's going on? Like, it was so, you can hear, like, right now, you can hear everyone's just like, what's going to happen next? But here's the story. Kale's like, I never went to the casket. 
And that's how the class ended. <laughs> and the next class, we're like, hey, why did, why did you finish the story? He goes, I didn't finish the story because the story had no future. I didn't take the steps in faith that I believe God was asking me to do. And I know it's a weird story, but friends, what is God going to challenge us to do that? He's going to stretch us. And has he already done that? And have we sat on our hands when those opportunities arose? Friends, do not place a limit on what God can do. I know this story is weird, but has God raised people in the Bible? Could he do it? He could. Like, again, we're not a happy, clappy, shalamanama church. <laughs> Joke, that's a laugh. Yeah, you guys are going to laugh. We're not that kind of a church. But, man, that is a biblical thing. But we don't, we don't let God stretch us. And, friends, I believe God's going to try and stretch us as a community. Will, be, will we be ready when he asks us to be stretched? So, anyway, we know the story. Jesus will... Get those, those pieces of bread and fish. He'll multiply them. He'll feed the crowd. He shows up. He challenges their perception of who he is. And, you know, the other thing that stands out in this story, and this is very important when it comes to being a disciple, Luke doesn't record a lot of important things that should have happened at a Jewish meal. There was no Jewish preparing of food to Jewish standards. There should have been water vessels. We don't know if the fish was clean or unclean. I'm assuming it was clean. But we know that there were very highly likely Gentiles mixed with the Jews. And Jews don't eat with Gentiles because it makes their food unclean. We never talk about this stuff, but it's important. And what you see in this story is that Jesus doesn't seem to care. Can you see that? And this is the bit I probably struggled the most when it came to preparing this sermon. Because I wonder if there are things that Jesus is going to do. I'm not saying he's asking us to throw out our theology. Please don't hear Pastor Ryan saying this. But I kind of wonder if Jesus is going to ask us to step into situations that are going to make us feel very uncomfortable as Seventh-day Adventists. I'm going to share a story. A very, it's a true story. I believe it's a true story. And it'll illustrate the point. I was very nervous to write this on my computer, let alone share it. There's a preacher that I like. His name's Francis Chan. He's very much about getting into the community practical faith. He's not an Adventist guy. And when I was at college, I used to listen to a wide you know, variety of sermons. I'd listen to Uncle Doug. You know, I'd listen to Dwight. And I had my own other people that I'd listen to who weren't Adventists. And I remember hearing Francis Chan. He was a guy I really like. I still admire this guy. Um, I don't agree with all of his theology, but he shares this story about at his, at his mega church, when he was trying to get it to grow, they advertised the whole community around their church in Simi Valley, California. And they let a box and said, hey, we are inviting you to our church. We're going to provide you a meal. Now, as it turns out, it was well received by the community because there was literally thousands of people that showed up and they were not expecting thousands. And now they're faced with this problem, how are we going to feed thousands? We prepared food for hundreds. And him and his prayer team start getting on their knees, Lord Jesus, we, we've promised food. We don't have the budget. We don't have the means. We don't, we, how are we going to feed all these people? You are going to look so bad after this event because we overpromised. Does it sound like a story we've just read? Right? People are receptive. Anyway, he's like, literally, we've been praying. And then, you know, moments after our prayer, we get a phone call from the local butcher. And the local butcher calls us and says, Hey, Francis, I know you guys are a church. Our freezers, our refrigeration mechanisms have stopped working. We've got cold rooms full of meat that are going to go bad within the next day. Can you use it? Can they use it? Yes, they can. And he's like, yes. So they get trucks of meat and they have the biggest Barnings barbecue you've ever seen. Now, we already struggle with this because we're Adventists and we don't eat meat. Well, I do. All right. Now, here's the thing that 
Uh, that's not the struggle I had with the story. This is where you will struggle with the story. Francis then goes on to describe the meat they ate. <laughs> they had steaks, beef steaks. They had lamb chops. They had pork ribs. Whoa. Hold me, your Lord. I'm like, God, I, I prayed about this. How are you going to do a miracle where you feed thousands and you gave them pork? We have an issue, right? I can't tell you how to interpret this. What I do know is that God showed up. Can we deny that? God is going to do things that unsettle us. Does that mean we should all start eating pork now? No. I mean, if it was off, no. <laughs> no, we're not going to do that. But friends, when we're being a disciple, God is going to stretch us into areas that make us uncomfortable. But if it means his kingdom is going to move forward, then we've got to be okay with it. And I think for some of us, and I say us, not just packing, but just our Adventist denomination, we've let our values hold us back from what God might be willing to do in the community. I, and I'm not giving us a roadmap on what this looks like. I'm just showing you what's in the story. I'm telling you things that have happened in life. Friends, being a disciple, it's stretching, it's uncomfortable. I'm going to invite our worship team up now. We're going to sing our final song, This Power in the Blood. But I want you to think about this because I, I know if I can see people are thinking. <laughs> I have to wake you up. The heat is on. <laughs> you can see you falling asleep. But guys, Jesus, like I said last week, we think we know who Jesus is. But Jesus was turning the disciples' perception of what the Messiah was in its, you know, whatever they, that, that vessel is. He was completely turning it around. And friends, if we're going to finish the work as Seventh-day Adventists, we want to see Jesus come, he is going to warp our perception of what it means to, to, to go out into the world.